The Honda Rebel is a beginner's cruiser no more. Many a current rider started out on the old Rebel 250 and probably has fond memories of that beginner-friendly bike which has now been upgraded to 286cc and given a modern makeover. And a 471cc twin-cylinder model was also added for those who want more impressive highway performance. However, it wasn't until the Rebel 1100 came out, a bike that shares its 1084cc engine with the Africa Twin, that the Rebel really got serious. This bike, which I reviewed last summer, link in the top right corner, is a very nice, very affordable muscle bike for those who want to do more than just cruise easy. However, in the cruiser world, it's all about baggers these days, and since Honda doesn't currently have a big bore twin-cylinder cruiser, the company decided to add a fork-mounted batwing fairing and some hard bags to the big Rebel to effectively build the smallest, least expensive and best handling bagger on the market. How does this bike stack up, and should you be trading in your street glide for one of these? For the answers to these pressing questions, stay tuned. And as always, if you're finding this content valuable, please consider hitting the subscribe and like buttons and sharing this video with friends. Baggers are nice bikes. Big, luxurious, good for touring, especially on the highway, decently handling in the curves and generally cool sounding cruisers with big fairings, good weather protection and lots of space for your stuff in lockable hard bags. They are wildly popular in North America and growing in popularity elsewhere. But they are also pricey, big and intimidating to smaller, older or beginner riders who may also want to jump on the bagger wagon. And so the new Rebel 1100T, T for touring, hits the market hoping to attract a new demographic. Those looking for a two-thirds size bagger that does everything a regular bagger can do and some things better. As already mentioned, the engine is a 1084cc parallel twin which due to its 270 degree crank has the soulful lumpy sound of a 90 degree V-twin. This motor puts out a very healthy 86 horsepower in line with most modern 17 and 1800cc baggers though it's a bit down on torque with 72 pound feet. In my experience, the bike seems more powerful than the 100 horsepower Indian Scout, which may be due to the chain drive transferring that power to the pavement more efficiently than the Indian's belt. It may also be due to the Rebel's low gearing, which has it turning 4,500 RPM plus at highway speeds. These power characteristics are awesome for explosive acceleration and quick passing, but for long distance highway cruising, an overdrive would be appreciated for a more relaxed and fuel efficient ride. The Rebel 1100T does, however, offer cruise control, a must on any long distance touring bike. Additionally, the bike has four rider modes, sport, standard, rain, and a customizable user mode which the rider can dial in to their preferences. Modes can be switched on the fly which is convenient for those times when you're on the highway and run into rain. Simply switch your mode and close the throttle to complete the action, like you would when turning off cruise control. I hit a pretty heavy storm on the bike and rain mode made for a very predictable and stable ride which could still be plenty fast just with a gentler throttle and more intrusive traction control. You get two choices of transmission in Canada, either the standard 6-speed manual or the 6-speed DCT automatic that I tested which can also be turned to manual mode and switched with thumb and trigger buttons on the left handlebar. I'm not crazy about that setup so I left it in automatic. Shifts are very quick and smooth. The bike sometimes shifts in corners which doesn't affect handling at all, and power modes do change the shift points. Unfortunately for US viewers, only the DCT is listed on the US website for 2023. Sport mode is ridiculous with the DCT transmission holding onto gears way too long for my comfort. I left it in standard mode except in heavy rain. Even in this mode the shifts are sporty. Whack open the throttle to make a quick pass and the bike shifts down instantly and takes off like a bat out of hell. It feels faster than the 1700cc Kawasaki Vulcan Vaquero I tested a few weeks ago, link in the top right corner. If you are a beginner and hoping to start out on a bagger, I would caution you to be careful with the Rebel 1100T. It's not beginner level power. But if you insist, put it in rain mode for a couple of months as you get used to it. One thing that is pretty accessible about this bagger is its weight. With the typical bagger weighing in at 850 plus pounds, the Rebel 1100T tips the scales at a svelte 525 with the DCT version coming in at 547. 
This is 33 to 34 pounds heavier than the standard Rebel 1100, so that must be the combined weight of the fairing, bags, and mounting hardware. This bike's lightweight and low 27.6 inch seat height make it easy to control at slow speeds and toss into curves. The suspension is not sophisticated with a non-adjustable standard fork with 4.8 inches of travel and a pair of preload adjustable shocks with 3.7 inches of travel out back. You'll definitely feel the bigger bumps, but these shocks are still way better than what passes for rear suspension on competing sportsters and scouts. The ride is definitely sporty and the bike carves the bends in a most uncruiser-like fashion, almost as well as some seriously sporty naked motorcycles. I'm not saying to take it to the track, but with 35 degrees of lean angle I didn't scrape anything on this motorcycle, which is not the case with most cruisers. The brakes perform well, despite only having one disc up front, and I noticed no fade even after mashing on them repeatedly. The front brake lever is adjustable and the clutch lever was non-existent, as I had the DCT. I was quite impressed with the mirrors on this bike, as they were set wide and provided an excellent view of what was behind me. Do still perform a shoulder check before changing lanes though, as most motorcycles have a good sized blind spot. Comfort is key on a bagger, and here the Rebel 1100 lags behind the bigger bikes. Like on the standard Rebel 1100, being a 6 footer, I felt cramped. Honda has not changed the ergonomics of this touring variant from the power cruiser that it used to be. The reach is fine for me, but I was cramped on the mid controls. Honda does offer accessory forward controls on this bike, and bigger riders should go for them. It would make the bike slightly less sporty, but far more comfortable for taller folks. The seating position is great for someone like Brooke, who is 5'7 or 170 centimeters tall, and although Brooke didn't ride this bike, she was quite comfortable on the regular Rebel 1100, which has the same ergonomics. As a passenger, she felt cramped on the tiny back seat, and legroom wasn't great. This is one of those baggers that is probably not suited for a two-up cross-country tour unless you upgrade that back seat and your passenger is on the shorter side. The front seat was decently padded. Not the best, but neither the worst that I've experienced on a cruiser. One comfort aspect of the bike with which I was quite impressed was the fairing. It didn't have a stereo or nav like some of the big bikes, but it did provide excellent weather protection for my hands and torso with minimal helmet buffeting. Having ridden through a deluge, I emerged relatively dry everywhere except my legs which admittedly had little weather protection. This batwing fairing has clearly seen some wind tunnel testing. Well done Honda! The hard bags were a mixed bag. They were lockable with the ignition key and kept my stuff dry even through heavy rain without the need for bag liners. However, like the rest of the bike, they were small measuring a combined 35 liters, with the right bag being somewhat smaller to accommodate the exhaust pipe. For comparison purposes, the Goldwing bagger has two 30 liter bags, while the Vaquero I tested a few weeks ago had enormous 44 liter bags for a massive carrying capacity. The 1100T is a smaller bike with smaller bags, but they are proportionally smaller than the bike. Enough for an overnight trip or to bring some rain gear, warm clothes and a snack, but not enough for a serious tour. They do look nicely integrated though. Besides the small bags, one other flaw that keeps the Rebel 1100T from full touring bagger glory is the 13.6 liter fuel tank. The low fuel light is on after 200k or less, which equals about 125 miles. Not enough for a touring bike. If you're touring with a group of bagger bros on this, they'll have to stop for you to refuel more often, which isn't ideal. Honda could have slapped a larger tank on this bike without much redesign. I don't understand why they didn't. So finally we come to price. For reference, the Vaquero I tested earlier is the least expensive big bagger and costs 18.6 thousand US dollars and 21.4 thousand Canadian, with comparable Harleys well above that. The Rebel 1100T in contrast is fairly inexpensive, just over 12k US for the DCT and just under 16 Canadian for standard and 17 for DCT. That's deceiving however because Honda now includes destination and freight charges in its prices while other manufacturers do not. Out the door the Honda is way less expensive, which is understandable it being a smaller bike without a stereo. However, even when compared to similar sized competition from Harley, Indian and Triumph, bikes which do not have fairings or bags, the Honda is less expensive. If you're wondering how much more the T costs over the standard Rebel, it's 1800 more US and only 1300 more Canadian. 
Surprisingly, it's a better deal in Canada, which I think is totally worth it for the extra weather protection and convenience of lockable hard bags. So, while the Rebel 1100T is a good deal on a mid-sized cruiser, it doesn't really compete with the big baggers. It is significantly and visibly smaller. But it does fill a niche that I think was a bit lacking and there is a significant portion of riders who will be attracted to it. As stated before, confident beginners can put it in rain mode and start on it. Be really careful though, this is a lot of bike. Paradoxically, it will also appeal to experienced, performance-oriented riders who might be coming off a naked bike and looking for a bit more comfort and practicality. This thing rips through the corners and transitions from side to side like no big bagger can. Budget-minded riders who want to ride with their big bagger friends but don't want to spend big bagger money now have a reliable option that can keep up with the big bikes. Smaller riders or current riders who are getting older and don't want to wrestle an 850-pound bike can now rejoice. They have a much more manageable option. Finally, there are riders with arthritis in their hands who cannot keep squeezing that clutch all day who will be very happy about the DCT option. There's a lot to like about this bike. Its lightweight, very strong performance, Honda reliability and reasonable price should make it quite popular. During my week with it, I got tons of looks from people trying to figure out what I was riding. I have a feeling that the demand is there. But I can't help thinking that with just a bit more effort, Honda could have made it perfect but didn't. Slapping a fairing and bags on a bike do not make it a tourer automatically. I'd put higher gearing on it to make it more relaxed at highway speeds and I'd also give it a larger tank. Maybe the aftermarket will handle that, but I think Honda should have done it out of the box. The cramped seating position for taller riders is easily fixed with forward controls, so I won't harp on that too much. And like its standard cousin, it's limited to 100 miles per hour or 160 kilometers per hour, which I believe is due to some gnarly head shake that happens above that speed, which is a little disappointing because the bike is an absolute ripper. So to be limited on the top end like that is a drag. There are ways of disabling the speed limiter, but I wouldn't recommend it as a tank slapper at over 100 miles per hour would surely ruin your day. Still, the real performance fun on this bike is to be had at lower speeds in the twisties due to its light weight and great for a cruiser handling. Personally, I'd opt for the lighter standard model as I like working the clutch. Then I'd replace that unattractive pipe with something a bit more stylish. The Rebel 1100T is not a looker with its industrial adventure bike engine, but it does cut a mean and purposeful stance in that power cruiser style, and with an aftermarket can would sound proper. So what do you think? Is this going to spawn a new class of bike? Will we soon have the Nightster Glide and Scout Touring? If this thing sells well, you bet we will. And quite frankly, good idea. Riders who would normally not consider a bagger may see this thing and go, yup, that's for me. Are you one of those riders or do you have a friend or loved one who is? Please leave your thoughts in the comments below and ride safe out there.